We shall send to the moon. In September 1962, President John F. Kennedy stepped up to the podium and pledged to land a man on the moon before the decade was out. Now at the time, this pledge, this promise was quite literally a moonshot. People in the audience, according to reports, many of them thought that Kennedy was out of his mind. Even officials at NASA thought that Kennedy was promising the impossible. Some of the medals required to build the rockets hadn't even been invented. We jumped into the cosmic void and hoped that we'd grow wings on the way up. And miraculously, those wings grew. Just less than seven years after Kennedy's pledge, Neil Armstrong took his giant leap for mankind. It is often celebrated as a triumph of technology, but it wasn't. It was a triumph of a certain thought process, uh, moonshot thinking. I'm Ozan Morol. I'm a rocket scientist turned professor and best-selling author of Think Like a Rocket Scientist. Moonshot thinking is that sweet spot between idealism and pragmatism. That's where the magic happens. So not only do you dream big, but you also combine it with an actionable, concrete, step-by-step -step blueprint for actually making that dream a reality. We worked backward from the intended end, which was to put a man on the moon and figured out exactly what would be required to, to get there. It became this step-by-step -step blueprint. So the, it's not just about you know, sprinkling some pixie dust and hoping that your, your dreams magically take flight. Now this was humanity's first actual moonshot, but we've been taking metaphorical moonshots long before Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the lunar surface. Our ancestors that first blazed the trail to some unknown corner of the earth, they took a moonshot. It was a moonshot for slaves to reach for freedom, for women to take the ballot. We really are a species of moonshots, even though we've largely forgotten it. We've been seduced in part because of social conditioning and in part because of educational conditioning, to believe that, that small dreams are wiser than moonshots, that coasting is better than soaring, that flying lower is safer than flying higher. But as any pilot will tell you, flying higher is actually safer because if your engine quits at high altitudes, you've got more options for gliding your plane to safety. But if your engine quits when you're flying low, the possibilities in flight, just like the possibilities in life, tend to be a lot more limited. So there are three concrete steps required for moonshot thinking. First, you begin by defining your moonshot, and the key there is to, to aim higher than you think is wise. You don't literally have to aim for the moon. So we need to define what our purpose in life is, what our goal is, and then come up with a moonshot using that North Star. Your moonshot might be to launch that business. Your moonshot might be writing a book. Number two, you apply backcasting. Now I'm sure you're familiar with the term forecasting. Forecasting basically takes what's in front of us and projects it into the future. Now the problem with that thinking is it starts with the status quo. It takes all of our problematic assumptions, our biases, our limitations, and just compounds them and projects them into the future. Backcasting does the opposite. So instead of beginning with the status quo, you begin with a desired outcome in mind. So you begin with Armstrong on the lunar surface, and then you work backward from there to figure out exactly what's required, a step-by-step -step blueprint for actually making that dream a, a reality. So step number three is to begin with the hardest part first. Because not all moonshots are possible, and if your moonshots is not plausible, you want to know that as soon as possible, which is why it's important to start with the hardest part first as opposed to the easiest part. As I look out into the future, I think one of the moonshots that's going to be really important for humanity is ending tribalism. Modern society has segmented itself into these different tribes, different communities that are divided across political, social, or religious lines. And it's literally tearing us apart. We are operating in these echo chambers, exacerbated by social media algorithms, exacerbated by clickbait media headlines, exacerbated by the fact that you know we only follow people whose views we like on Twitter. If we can figure out a way of ending tribalism and allowing people to engage with each other, even when they don't see eye to eye, even when they do disagree with each other, that would be an incredible feat.